Welcome back. Okay, we're talking about the Cindy algorithm, which allows us to discover sparse nonlinear models from time series data. And specifically, we've gone through kind of the overview of the Cindy algorithm, and we've identified four key challenges that I'm talking about in this video series. So we've already talked about the challenge of the data, how much data, what quality, what quantity, and so on. And today we're going to zoom in specifically to this question of the coordinates. What variables should we measure in the Cindy algorithm? So I want to go back to this picture here uh, because I think this really illustrates the, uh, the idea. This is the overview schematic we used to illustrate Cindy for the first time where you assume that you have data from a complex system like the Lorentz model and you measure that data in the variables x, y, and z. You compute the derivatives, you build a library, and you find the fewest t candidate terms in this library uh, that are needed to describe x dot, y dot, and z dot. So these are terms in the dynamical system. But there is a huge assumption here that we usually gloss over. At least when we wrote the first paper five years ago, we kind of glossed over this big issue of how did we know that x, y, and z were the right variables to measure? That's a huge amount of upfront knowledge uh, about your system that X, Y, and Z are the right systems to measure for the Lorentz system. What if someone gave me this data and it was rotated a little bit or distorted a little bit? The, in those coordinates, I might not get a sparse nonlinear representation. I might need a dense representation with a little bit of all of these terms in it, okay? Um, so that's a key question, is how do we even know what the right variables are to measure in the first place? Now, in lots of cases, as you know, kind of an expert uh, scientist or engineer, we know something about our system of interest. So I highly recommend using Cindy as a tool for guided model discovery. It's not purely automatic. You don't just turn the crank and get models out. You're the expert. You know what your data is telling you. You know what kinds of models you think you might want to get out of this system. And you might have an idea of what variables you're measuring, what the units are, if they're physical, if you think that there would be relationships. So oftentimes you can get a good sense of if you're in the right coordinate system or not, kind of as an expert researcher. But there might be cases where we really don't know. So for example, if we're measuring the brain and we want to get a Cindy model for patterns in the brain, or we're measuring the spread of a disease on a continent, how do we know if we're measuring the right variables? How do we know if those are the variables that admit a sparse representation uh, in this model space? And so that's uh, the kind of question we're going to talk about today. Okay? Now, if I have a high dimensional system like a fluid flow, um, I already showed you that you can discover a partial differential equation that describes this, the Navier-Stokes equations. That's fine. But what if I want an ordinary differential equation, something I can do uh, kind of ODE analysis on? And I'll point out, um, this Cindy library, it expresses a very large space of possible models. So, for example, in this set of uh, polynomials in X, Y, and Z up to fifth order, I think that there are 81 terms in this, this library, which means there are 81 coefficients in each of the columns of C. And that means that there are many possible model structures that could be encoded. So for example, if I wanted a model that had exactly two terms, two of these column vectors of theta, I would have 81 choose two possible models with, with two terms active. If I had three terms in the dynamics, I would have 81 choose three. And this gets really big really fast. So this encodes a tremendous amount of possible model structures. If we define sparsity as models that have 10 or less terms from theta, then there are uh, 81 choose 10 plus 81 choose nine dot 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 possible models. That's more than a quadrillion models. And that's part of the power of the Cindy algorithm is that it allows you to very efficiently kind of through sparse optimization find out of that huge space of a quadrillion models the right structure that actually describes your dynamics. But there's a catch. So the space of possible models of different structures is huge. 
But this library itself actually scales really poorly <laughs> with the dimension of the state vector x, y, and z. So we'll talk about that library scaling issue in the next lecture on the library, but it's something I want you to have in the back of your mind now because we can't build a library with uh, 100 variables up to fifth order. That would be way too big. The library itself would be too big. And so that's an issue we have when we deal with high dimensional systems like this. When I simulate this uh, fluid flow on my computer, I simulate this as a discretized system of ordinary differential equations with maybe you know, 10 or 100,000 degrees of freedom, depending on the discretization. But we know that there are often low dimensional coordinate systems where you can describe this data more efficiently. So even though this requires 10 or 100,000 degrees of freedom to simulate in my computer, we know that there are these low dimensional patterns that describe most of the behavior here. And if I write the dynamics in this coordinate system in terms of these three modes, the amplitudes of those modes admit a very simple differential equation. And so that's one way uh, to handle getting the right coordinates for Cindy, is if I have a spatial temporal system like a fluid flow or a plasma flow or something like that, I can often take the singular value decomposition, also known as principal components analysis or proper orthogonal decomposition, to get a low dimensional basis in which I can represent those dynamics. And the amplitudes of these three modes, x, y, and z, those are the amplitudes, that's generally a very good coordinate system for representing my dynamics. So if you don't know anything else about the system, but it's high dimensional, the first thing you might want to try is taking the SVD, the singular value decomposition, to get a low dimensional basis where you can build an efficient library and start to identify models. Uh, and when we do that for you know, the flow past a cylinder for this example here, we can build our model library in those three variables. It's still tractable. This library is not too big to work with. And we can identify a model that has the right structure and the right dynamics in this coordinate system. Okay? So that's just a general good idea. If you have high dimensional spatial temporal data, first try taking the SVD, see if that gives you a good coordinate system where you can build models. And we have a lot of theoretical basis for why we think this might be a good idea in fluid mechanics, in plasma physics, in lots of spatial temporal systems. Because the singular value decomposition is an orthogonal basis that is kind of optimally tailored to your particular data to represent it as well as possible with as few degrees of freedom as possible. That's good for our modeling. Uh, and we also know that if I take this expansion, this Galerkin expansion, and I plug it into the governing Navier-Stokes equations, when I expand that out, I get a nonlinear ordinary differential equation in terms of the amplitudes of these modes. And so it gives us some hope that there is a, a differential equation that describes this evolution that we can discover using the Cindy algorithm. Okay, long story short, try the SVD. It really works in a lot of cases, especially fluids, works like a charm. Now, um, the SVD, the singular value decomposition, can be thought of in kind of modern neural network language as a shallow linear autoencoder. It essentially can be built as a neural network with a high dimensional input and output and a single low dimensional latent uh, layer given by this Z variable where your network loss function is trying to minimize the error between input and output, knowing that you're choking down to only a few degrees of freedom and then lifting again. So caveat, you never actually want to compute the SVD this way, but you can think of the SVD as this shallow linear autoencoder, which means that if your SVD coordinates aren't quite cutting it for you, if they're not quite good enough for building Cindy models, you could generalize this into a deep nonlinear autoencoder. So instead of just a single hidden layer, this deep autoencoder has many, many later layers for the encoder and many layers for the decoder, and it also has nonlinear activation functions. So what this allows you to do is instead of building a orthogonal subspace, a linear subspace, the deep autoencoder is designing a nonlinear manifold that's parameterized by Z. And oftentimes that allows us to massively reduce the number of degrees of freedom uh, required to describe these dynamics.
And so that's exactly the strategy that Kathleen Champion took in designing her Cindy autoencoder uh, framework. Uh, so, so I think this is one of my favorite papers uh, that came out of the lab. This is work with uh, Kathleen Champion, uh, who is a PhD student with Nathan Kutz and me, uh, Bethany Lush, who is a postdoc with us, uh, Nathan and myself. And essentially what Kathleen did here is combine the uh, power of an autoencoder to learn good coordinate systems with a sparse nonlinear model in the latent space Z. So this is super cool. Autoencoders learn good coordinate systems or manifolds that describe your data, and you can add additional constraints in the loss function of this, this neural network training so that the dynamics on that latent layer are sparse nonlinear models in this kind of Cindy framework. So essentially, uh, there are these additional loss terms that allow us to train this model to find good coordinates and Cindy models. And I'll talk about this again in the next lecture on, on the library, but I want to allude to it here, which is oftentimes polynomials are not the right terms to describe your dynamics. Maybe you have sines and cosines or Bessel's functions or some exotic nonlinearity. Well, oftentimes, by applying the right coordinate transformation, you can transform your system into a coordinate system where polynomials are a better uh, library to model your dynamics. This is very closely related to normal form theory from classical dynamical systems, which essentially says that through subsequent coordinate transformations, you can essentially kill uh, terms in a Taylor expansion and get sparse polynomial models for your dynamics. So there's a lot of theoretical foundations for why this is a good idea. Um, and it's one of my absolute favorite approaches to Cindy when you really uh, have kind of complex uh, data. And so in this example, you could take a very complex high dimensional system. So this is, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe 100 degrees of freedom in space and time series measurements of this evolving. And through the autoencoder, you can learn a coordinate transformation where the dynamics are sparse. Uh, and in this case, I believe that the discovered model was actually a different sparse model. But if you rotated this model, you recovered the original Lorentz system, which is super cool. So up here, all we had was high dimensional data. And underneath it, there were some Lorentzian dynamics. So we could learn the coordinate transformation uh, that gave us a sparse model that was within a rotation of the true Lorentz dynamics. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, and we'll talk more about this, this later. Okay, good. Um, a couple other things you can do. So I've been talking now about if you have really high dimensional measurements, how do you crunch those down using either uh, linear SVD coordinates or a nonlinear autoencoder? But what if you have too few measurements? That's also very often the case. Maybe I have a complex system and I have one scalar measurement or two scalar measurements. You know, I have an electrode in the brain. What can I get from that kind of data? And so, um, this paper really changed the way I think about, uh, about these sparse models. This is work with uh, J.C. Loiseau and Bernd Nowak, where we were modeling fluid flow systems, like the flow past this three-cylinder configuration. And we didn't want to assume that we had the full measurements of the entire velocity field everywhere. That's a pretty big assumption. If I'm flying you know, a Boeing aircraft, I don't have the full wake velocity measurements behind my wing. I might have a few pressure measurements along the wing, or I might be able to measure my lift and drag. And so what JC showed is that if you just had lift and drag measurements on these three cylinders, and you had clean enough measurements that you could compute the derivatives, you can actually build very accurate Cindy models in those lift and drag coordinates those intrinsic coordinates. And this is kind of uh, the lift you know, on the three airfoils from the simulations, the direct numerical simulations, that's the ground truth, and from our Cindy models in the blue dash line. Almost perfect agreement. So one of the nice things about these Cindy models is that because it's using regression, it can find sparse models that approximate the dynamics on kind of strange variables you wouldn't think to model on, like lift and drag. And there's a lot of associated benefits with modeling in these coordinates uh, that I'll talk about in the video on sparse fluid modeling. Good. Okay, uh, one of the last things I'll show you here is um, if, if you have too few measurements, again, if, you, if there's some variables you're not measuring, some latent states, 
What do you do with that? And this came about because of a reviewer comment in our original uh, Cindy paper five years ago. We got some fantastic, insightful comments from the referees, and one of them was this. So in our Lorentz system, we assumed we had access to x, y, and z, and we could compute the derivatives. But what if we only had access to x? What if there were hidden variables? y and z just weren't available to us in this measurement. What could we do with Cindy? And so this actually started an entire new research uh, avenue in our, in our collaborative groups along uh, kind of latent dynamics and time delay coordinates. And it's a fascinating story. There's a lot more to this. I'm just giving you the high level sketch. So we're assuming that we're measuring a limited subset of measurements um, and we don't have access to the full state. So, you know, we just have X measurements. What you can do under certain conditions given by the Tokens delay embedding uh, for nonlinear chaotic systems or by observability for linear dynamical systems, you can essentially build a matrix of time delayed coordinates of this scalar measurement X. So this is a Hankel matrix where each column is an augmented vector of your state at uh, either past or future times. So X at time one, time two, time three, dot, 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 to time Q. And you can build this big matrix. You can compute its singular value decomposition. And you can essentially discover eigen time delay coordinates, or these little short time uh, trajectories, that allow you to embed this X measurement into a higher dimensional space given by these, uh, call, these rows of V. This is a classic delay embedding. This is not something we invented. This has been around uh, since the 80s doing this SVD on the Hankel matrix. But when you then try to apply Cindy to this system here, some very interesting things happen. So you can essentially try to design a Cindy model in these V coordinates, in these time delay coordinates. And when we find the sparsest model and we allow ourselves to have nonlinear terms and linear terms, we find that the sparsest models tend to be linear, honest to goodness linear models with no quadratic terms, no cubic terms, just linear. And this has deep connections, it turns out, to Koopman operator theory. We kind of discovered, we stumbled on this connection that time delay coordinates essentially provide almost an optimal coordinate system to getting a Koopman linear system, a sparse Koopman linear system. And we've written, you know, four or five follow-on papers exploring the structure of this, uh, why it works, how it works, applying it to chaotic systems and deterministic systems, and we've learned a lot. So I'll put some links uh, to those papers and, and videos in, in the description. And this model allows you to do things like predict even very chaotic dynamics. Um, you know, so like you can predict when you're about to switch lobes to the other side of the Lorentz attractor. And you can even color code your attractor based on when it's essentially acting like a linear system and when uh, it's about to switch, things like that. So we learned about this because we were trying to handle Cindy on systems with latent variables. And so it turns out that time delay coordinates uh, plus Cindy gives you a very, very accurate Koopman linear model, okay? And there's like a whole uh, many papers and an hour long video on this, so I'm not gonna dwell on this for too long. Just a long way of saying you can handle latent measurements oftentimes by delay embedding. And this is actually something Kathleen Champion explored quite a bit, which is for non-chaotic systems, you often get a perfectly closed model using those delay embeddings with the Cindy uh, regression procedure. Okay, good. Uh, so we've been talking about this kind of big Cindy overview and specifically these key challenges. So now we've covered challenge zero of the data, challenge one of the coordinates, and in the next videos, we're gonna talk about the library. So how do you actually build that theta matrix so it's well conditioned, so that it describes the dynamics of your system, so that it's not too large? Uh, and what optimization algorithms do we use to actually find those sparse models in the first place? Okay, all coming up soon. Thank you.